Well, hello, James and Cindy, and hello to all of James and Cindy's listeners. This is Jim Brown here. I'm a an old boat nut, a multi-hull proponent, and uh, James and Cindy have given me a chance to, you know, play my tape and tell my story again. We had a good long telephone interview, and they asked for some pictures, and I've been trying to figure out how to present them. My problem is that I've gotten so I can't see for beans. This really should be a video with the image on the screen and voiceover captions. But sorry to say, I cannot work with the video editor anymore. So we're just going to go by the numbers, and we'll take the last three digits of the label for each photograph before the dot jpeg that's enough to identify these few photos except there may be some confusion about the first two they are both labeled 001 dot jpeg so we'll start with the obvious portrait of my wife joanna i think this was taken in the mid 70s after we had cruised in our trimaran scrimshaw for about three years with our two teenage sons. We left California in 1972 and ended up here in Virginia, where we've been ever since in uh, 1975. Joanna has helped to drive my dream for 62 years that we've been together now. We've been reasonably healthy and extremely lucky. Uh, uh, we like our kids and they like us and Whenever we get together, we still talk about the trip. Those three years that we spent knocking around in Scrimshaw. That's a whole nother story. The next fuzzy photograph is something I didn't get around to talking about much in our telephone interview, James. This one and the next two go back to my premarital schooner bumming days. I think I mentioned in our interview that... <laughs> After flunking out of college, I got a job on a boat. Well, this was the boat. Yeah, that's me out there on the end of that 22-foot-long bowsprit. This is actually a Polaroid snapshot that was given to me by one of the passengers. The next shot, number 002, shows the boat. It's a picture of a very professional picture showing the schooner Janine, J-A-N-E-E-N. 151 foot, 14 foot, 9 inch deep steel staysail schooner designed by Fife and built in Scotland. A really glorious yacht which had fallen into hard times. She had been owned by Sir Oliver Simmons, who at the time, back in the early, this is in the early 1950s, uh, he was the uh, representative of British royalty in the Bahamas. And he and his family, he had two daughters, Jeanette and Doreen, thus Janine, used this vessel to come and go between Great Britain and the Bahamas. And apparently Sir Oliver thought that it was really cool. I think, I think it is too, but his daughters and his wife didn't like it at all. From what I heard, whenever the wind blew, they were pleading with the captain to start the engine. I did not sail with those people. I sailed with the next owner, Captain Mike Burke, the infamous startup of Windjammer Barefoot Cruises out of Miami. Sir Oliver's crew had stacked the boat up on Great Inagua Island in the southern Bahamas. It had laid there on its side in the reef with the surf breaking over it for a few days before they got a seagoing tug out from Miami to go pull it off of the reef. It had been half full of water, which sort of destroyed it, much of its yachty character. And so Sir Oliver sold it to Mike Burke. And while Mike had a very checkered career in the tourism business, he was one of the pioneers of taking passengers for joy rides and diving charters in this boat and several others that he would eventually own. And while he had a reputation as quite a scoundrel as a businessman, the real reason he did it was that he loved the boats. 
he saw these big pre-war yachts languishing in the harbors of the world and bought up several of them and put them into operation. So I was going to school in Miami and they had a skin diving club as part of the university. I joined that club and one of the guys in the club had a sister who was the girlfriend of Mike Burke, who would become his wife, Joan. But with that connection, we got a deal on a diving charter, a weekend trip from Miami across to Bimini to go diving. Well, I enjoyed the diving, but I was totally captivated with the ship. Monday morning after that weekend in Bimini, I went down to see him and the ship again, said I would work for him for room and board. He gave me a job, and it turned out to be absolute salvation for me. I had been a terrible student, had pretty much failed at everything else I tried, and the next thing I knew, I was sailing as mate, a position for which I was totally unqualified, in a crew of six black Bahamians. And living and working with these people was a real education for me. I will never forget those people. We sailed 10-day charters twice a month from Miami out to the Bahamas, to Cuba, and to Yucatan. We eventually had two five-day layovers per month in Havana. And, of course, <laughs> I ended up with a Cuban girlfriend and the cross-cultural experience with both the Bahamians and the Cubans was extremely formative for me. And the Bahamians were the crew for Oliver Simmons. They had sailed the ship before, and particularly the bosun, a great big guy named Fred McKenzie. Burke called him Darwin's missing link. But it was, it was Freddie who taught me the ways of a windjammer. And without that background, I never would have had the temerity to try to end up as a multi-hull designer. And the next shot, 003, also a picture of an old Polaroid, shows me again at the helm of Janine, about 1956. The next shot, 09-10, is a nice shot of my first so-called Sea Runner trimaran design, a 25-footer. This one owned and built by one Max Hemminger. Max was quite a character. He single-handed this boat from uh, San Francisco to Hawaii using what then was a very experimental wind vane self-steering device. And here, Max is out of the cockpit, letting the steering vane guide the boat in some rather raucous conditions on a very windy day in Monterey Bay. This was maybe 1964, and to set off single-handed out across the Pacific was quite a stunt in those days. I was very concerned that Max be prepared as much as possible for heavy weather. At that time, multi-hulls were very controversial vessels. They were really beginning to show their stuff. And uh, culturally, they were tending to cut off the roots of traditional sailors. And there was a great antithesis between the multi-hull people and the monohull or traditional crowd. So with the help of my late great friend, Joe Hudson, he and I got together and really helped Max get ready for the trip. And to give you an example of how it was that we really did not know what we were doing, we prepared Max with a drogue, a storm drogue, that is something to drag behind the vessel to keep it from broaching or turning sideways under the face of breaking waves. And I reasoned that with a, a, a multi-hull, we could tow a drogue by a bridle leading from both of the sterns of the outer hulls, the float hulls. And if the boat tried to turn right or left under the face of a breaker, one side would pull harder than the other. That is, if the boat tried to turn left, it would be the right-hand part of the bridle that would pull harder and straighten out the vessel. 
So we fixed up Max with a tire and a piece of chain tied around it and and uh, a bridle and had it all rigged and ready to go, ready for him to deploy easily in the event that he was overtaken by a Pacific gale. Now, to back up a bit, I should say that you can see this boat has a cockpit right in the middle, a central cockpit. And Max uh, had uh, done a little bit of improvising on his own. This feature was not included in the design. He had made the cockpit seats removable to show the ocean beneath them. That is, he wanted to be able to row the boat in a calm. He would, did not want to mess around with an outboard motor, so he rigged up oars and oar locks that went down through the open cockpit seats so that he could stand in the cockpit and row the boat. It seemed to us like a great idea. Well, sure as hell, Max was overtaken by a Pacific gale. Great big greenies coming at him. He deployed the tire drogue, and he could feel the tire pulling the boat backwards. <laughs> Actually, the wave and the boat were moving forward over the bottom at great speed, but the tire was restraining the vessel from surfing out ahead of the wave. So the crest would overtake the boat, and what happened on one big wave was that it crowded up underneath the wings of the trimaran and lifted up the seats in the cockpit. The seat covers in the cockpit were actually forced up by the, by the force of the wave and water poured into the cockpit by the hundreds of gallons and poured down through the hatches and into the boat. All of a sudden, Max found himself in gale conditions, <laughs> dragging this drogue with, uh, you know, with the main hull half full of water. Well, the first thing he did, and it was the right choice, was to cast off the drogue. He just jettisoned the tire and its chain and all that line out there in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and the self-steering device continued to steer the boat through the gale while Max went down below with a bucket and bailed. He could bail after replacing the cockpit seats and I think locking them down with turn pegs. He was able to bail the hull into the cockpit from both the forward cabin and the after cabin and the cockpit drained very rapidly. One of the features of these Sea Runner designs is that the centerboard trunk is located under the cockpit sole, under the floor of the cockpit, so that the trunk forms a giant self-bailer for the cockpit. So if Max had had the drop boards in on his cockpit hatches, that if he had had the hatches closed, those hatches that allowed the water to go down into the hull, if those hatches had been closed, the wave that entered the cockpit probably would have bailed itself out through the trunk without much incident. Anyway, the self-steering device controlled the boat with it half full of water while Max bailed. He made it on to Hawaii and just uh, rapped about the morning after the storm, how beautiful the waves were. No longer breaking, but great big rolling greenies. It was through many incidents such as that that we learned about multi-hull seamanship. The tire drogue on a bridle has been used subsequently by many vessels. It's become, <laughs> they call it despair tire. There's a lot more to say about storm survival in multi-hulls. Uh, I said a lot of it in my 1983 book called the case for the cruising trimaran, which is still available on Amazon. Okay, photo 009 was taken at, at about the same time that book was published. I think maybe 1983 or 4. Uh, this is a, a catamaran called the Boosey Cat. There's a long story connected with this vessel but uh, it illustrates the so-called constant camber construction method that I developed together with a lot of help from my friends. We won't go into her construction now to s except to say that it was novel, but this design was the predecessor to our series of 
so-called constant camber catamarans up to size 64 feet long that have been popular in the day charter business, the so-called catamarans. This boat was really the predecessor. I built her here at my shop in Virginia for the client Phil Weld, who was a, a venerated uh, multi-hull sailor. She's been up in Maine since the mid-80s, but was recently sold to our friend Doug Jane, J-A-Y-N-E. Doug has been responsible for building nine of our large charter catamarans, the, the, mostly the, uh, the 53-footer, and those boats are operating mostly in the Caribbean now. But Doug bought this boat this summer and, and uh, went up to Maine, spent a month getting her ready to bring home, down here to the Chesapeake where I live. Doug is a neighbor uh, 40 minutes away and so uh, we intend to bring Boosie Cat down here and nose her into the bank where she was launched you know back in 1985. The next picture 010 is well we're gonna jump around in time and space here a bit. This is a boat building training project at uh, Bujumbura, Burundi, in East Africa. My career took a sharp left turn in the 80s when I was, by chance, contacted by the World Bank and asked to go to Africa. They were having some problems with their boats on Lake Tanganyika. So we put in a boat building training project using the constant camber method. It's an appropriate low-tech method of producing large panels of plywood in compound curves. Vacuum laminated wood with epoxy produces structures that are extremely stiff and strong for their weight. But boy, I had quite a time working with these guys. These were Hutu and Tutsi tribes people from East Africa, and uh, I couldn't speak with them at all. I had to teach by example. It was another really intense, quite wonderful cross-cultural experience for me. The next shot, 019, shows the whole team with my counterpart. You can see the white face there. That's Josie Schredder, a Belgian boat builder and an old Africa hand. And uh, he and I had a chance to work together. He could speak with those people. I couldn't. That is photo 019. Let's now look at 007. One of those training projects led to another and to another. This one took place at a, at a tiny Central Pacific atoll called Funafuti, Tuvalu, where I was working for that great outfit called Save the Children, the best bang you can get for your community development buck. My son Stephen and I had a chance to Spend quite a while out there with those folks in an almost grass shack, almost grass skirt society, one of the forgotten corners of the earth, just west of the date line and just south of the equator, 600 miles from the next archipelago. And it was here that Stephen and I had the opportunity to try something that was fundamentally ridiculous to teach Polynesians how to build outrigger canoes. <laughs> There's a great story there. Now I, I can't tell it here. It's, a, it's in another of my books called Among the Multi-Hulls, Volume 2, also available on Amazon. It tells of my other training projects, in one in the Philippines, uh, one in Honduras, Altogether, a really rich time for me that came about quite by happenstance. The next shot, 032, jumps way ahead to the year 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000, the, the uh, Windrider 17 plastic trimaran, a boat that I designed for a large paddle sports manufacturer. I had never worked with manufacturers before, only individual owner builders and these little 17-foot polyethylene trimarans turned out to be 
quite a feature in my life, I'll tell you. I've had more fun in those boats than I have ever right to, any right to. This picture was taken on the Big Sur coast down south of Monterey, California. Steepest coastal slope in the contiguous 48, with uh, 50 miles with no harbors. And uh, with my dear friend Joe Hudson and a couple of other friends, Tim and Steve, we were able to cruise the California coast in 17 footers by coming and going through the surf in these little trimarans and camping on the beaches. This was, to me, the ultimate in beach camping. The next shot, 013. I must ask you to forgive these being out of order chronologically. Shows the largest of my constant camber catamarans, the Sea Runner 64. This one in use as a day charter boat crowded with Japanese tourists on the island of Saipan in the Western Pacific. There have been many designers and producers of charter catamarans, in particular Roger Hatfield of Gold Coast Yachts in St. Croix, Virgin Islands, who has, whose firm has built over 130 commercial multi-hulls like this. They have introduced literally millions of people to the sensations of multi-hull sailing. They operate out of the warm water resort areas all over the world. Some of them regularly introduce their patrons to the sensations of 20 knots uh, in uh, trade wind conditions. Okay, final picture, number one, two, three. And again, the order is quite out of sequence. These are the Wind Rider trimarans again, the ones that we sailed down the coast of California and that we have taken to Baja several times and run the length of the Sea of Cortez. These, uh, these vessels are lined up on the beach at... Uh, Sarasota, Florida, where the Sarasota Sailing Squadron holds an annual regatta they call the Buzelli, and it's and it's just a mile across the water to a tiki bar, which is where all the wind riders ended up. And this brings us right up to the minute. I have a wind rider 17. As a matter of fact, I have the first pre-production prototype that came out of the mold back in 2002. And the other day I was out for a sail on my little river here where we live in, on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay in southern Virginia. We've been here for 45 years. And I was out for a sail the other day and darn near had a collision with a motorboat. Why? Because I can't see where I'm going. It really waved a red flag. I came back home tied up to the dock and thought that it was very much like the close call I had that convinced me to give up driving 20 years ago because of my failing eyesight. I've been very proud to be able to keep sailing by myself up until now, but I've got to give it up at age 87. It's too bad. But the Wind Rider is <laughs> not destined for disuse. I am in the process now of building a tiny house to go on my Windrider 17. <laughs> the boat is going to end up being nothing but a float for a voluminous superstructure that will make it impossible for the boat to go anywhere ever again. If there's anything nearly as much fun as sailing, it's hanging out in an anchorage. And we have a nice anchorage right out in front of the house, complete with a mooring. And so I'm going to build my tiny house trimaran, put it out on the mooring and just using it, use it as a place to hang out. It's also the first step in a quest of mine to answer the question of what sort of boat would one like to have in the event of a global societal collapse? I'm not saying we're going to have one. I hope the hell we don't. But the way things are going these days, it sort of looks like it's at least time to think about what we would do in the event of the sort of thing happening worldwide that has already happened in so many other places in the world. The one I know best is Cuba. 
it sometimes seems to me that the whole world is going where Cuba has already been. And the people there remain jivey. As mentioned, I've been going to Cuba since the 1950s. I've been back several times recently. I love the place and the people, partly because they have learned to live very frugally while retaining their ebullience. But it looks to me like we could start having some geopolitical hotspots in our hemisphere. And ever since my time in Janine, I have uh, I've often thought that a boat would be a great place to consolidate one's asset in a in a vehicle slash domicile that could move easily without burning much, if any, fuel, and to live around the edges in the littoral zone where the water gets together with the land and where anyone with a boat and who really has his act together could perform vital services for people ashore. Looking way ahead, say, in the event of sea level rise, so much of our coastal infrastructure will be flooded, and that would open up thousands of new routes for shallow draft, highly energy efficient vessels. What sort of vessels? Well, let's talk about it. <laughs> I think of my tiny house as the minimal example. The name of my wind rider, incidentally, is Vision. I'm calling it Vision House, and as the project comes along and as the idea of a truly modern survival vessel develops, I hope with the help of your participation, perhaps we can come up with some suggestions as to what sort of a boat one would like to have in the event of global societal collapse. Oh yeah, there's a lot of bummer material there but it's also a very exciting challenge. I'm having a heck of a good time designing and building my vision house. I hope you've had a good time listening to all of my blather. And thanks to James and Cindy for making it available. I hope we can also post it on our website, outrigmedia.com, and we'll share a link from one to the other, okay? And let's try to develop this format of storytelling over old snapshots. This is Jim Brown, October 24th, 2020, just a few days before the election, which I hope will not break the great American experiment. Farewell, fair winds. <laughs>